You've all got my paper. One or two of you have kindly indicated how much you disagree with it already. So <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to uh, approach the matter from a slightly different angle, partly because I know at least some of you read the paper. I think I'm going to come to the same conclusion, but I'm doing it by way of, of what are loosely called um, principles of translation. Uh, that, that's not a univocal term, the word principles there. See, I think in practice, none of us is, is ever quite consistent in uh, basing our translation on rigid principles. It just doesn't happen that way. I worked for many years among the Zulus, and the motto of the Zulus is shoot first and then ask questions. And I find I do that when I'm translating. I, I, whatever comes into my head, I write it down. And then I think, I wonder why I did that. And sometimes I say, yes, you were right. And sometimes you must be a complete imbecile. How on, what on earth possessed you? So I think I want to say that, and maybe this is the last thing I'll say, now you can go gently to sleep, um, that translation is an art, not a science. Um, so there are some headings, that's really what those are, under which to uh, con consider the question. And bear in mind what I was saying about the admittedly slightly wretched new translation of the Roman Catholic Missal in my paper. So first, formal equivalence, and I, I know that the distinction is now outdated in translation theory between formal and dynamic equivalence, but let's just use them because they may be a handy way in. So formal equivalence, what do you do with, for example, the Hebrew construct infinitive, um, which comes into Latin, or into Greek and then into, into Latin, by repeating by way of a, of a participle. So, moriens mortus est, dying he died. Uh, you know the kind of thing. Um, and you get that in, certainly in the Dai version on which I was brought up, you get that because they, they, they went for a very, uh, uh, precisely a formal translation of the Latin because that would be closer to what the language that God spoke, I suppose. Um, and uh, what I've done um, because the, the Septuagint on the whole, and in my translation was of the Septuagint, not of the Masoretic text. On the whole, what I've done is to change the Greek. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this all the wrong way around. What the Greek does is a very formal translation and repeats the Hebrew construct infinitive. What I've done is to use a phrase like certainly or definitely. So you're still underlining the verb, but you're doing it in, in, a, rather, in a rather different way. Um, here's the thing here, there's, there's a word chutz in, in Hebrew which means street but it also means outside and very often you can feel the Septuagint translator scratching his head. So in um, Isaiah 51, 23, the, these examples are chosen largely at random. You've got vatashimi ka'aretz geveka vakachutz la'ovdim. Now the Greek translates that as you, um, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll translate this into English. You placed your uh, diaphragm level with the ground outside the pa for the passers-by. So that outside is translating the word chutz as though it did mean the adverb outside, but in fact it quite clearly in the Hebrew means street there. It's a tiny, tiny uh, example. And what I did there was to translate it, um, you placed your back level with the ground outside for the passers-by. So I've kept the, um, what you might call the deliberate mistake on the, part of the, uh, on the part of the Greek translator. I have no idea whether that was right or wrong, and, and you, can, you can referee on that. Or pro multis, um, you know, in the uh, new translation of the Eucharistic prayer, in the words of institution, they, uh, they have opted to translate antipollen or hupopollen as pro multis, whereas for the last 40 years in English it's been for all. And I notice that quite a lot of priests, when they get to that, in the words of uh, institution, they, they quite deliberately say, for all, big on the grounds that salvation is not narrowly restricted. I find I say many, because that's what the people have in front of them, those who are bothering to read or listen, but I know what I mean by many, and I do not mean that anyone is excluded from God's salvific purpose. So that's what goes on in formal equivalence, and I may come back later on to a Another example of that, that um, um, but I, I'll, I'll get on because I, I want to allow you time not to fall asleep but to think of some difficult questions to fling. 
Um, so what about dynamic equivalence? Um, I mean, roughly speaking, the, the set of translations that come under the King James Version, that's the authorised version, the RSV, NRSV, they went for basically what you'd call formal equivalence, so um, word for word or phrase for phrase. Um, examples of dynamic equivalent, well, the one obvious example is the Jerusalem Bible and the New Jerusalem Bible, or well, there are plenty of others. The, the whole Good News series of translations have gone for dynamic equivalents. So in Proverbs 4.10, you've got uh, in, in Hebrew, Vayrivu leka shanot chaim, and they shall be multiplied for you the years of life. Now the Septuagint translates that as and that is, the years of your existence, your life, shall be multiplied, that the ways of your life may become many. And you see what's happened there? They've added in a second phrase. And that particular translator, there are many translators in the Septuagint, but that particular translator <coughs> tends to do that, just to try and capture the whole thing. And he's added in a word that wasn't there. A favourite word of his is, is ways, which is there's a perfectly good Hebrew word for it, but it's not in the Hebrew original there. Um, here's another example of what I'm pleased to call um, dynamic equivalence. This is from my own translation, and a previous principal of Heathrop turned on me in a rage and said, how could you possibly do this? And the this was the opening of the translation of the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. And I've tried... I hardly dare mention it in this company, but I translated them all as not blessed are or happy are, but congratulations. And I could explain, I could explain it. Um, this is how it happened. I was, I was with a group from, I was working in South Africa, and we, we took a group to, to the Holy Land, and we were up at that lovely church of the Beatitudes above the Sea of Galilee. And um, we were sort of looking around at the architecture and all that sort of thing, and someone said, oh, Father, would you um, read something from the Sermon on the Mount, please? Or would you read the Beatitudes? And I only had my Greek New Testament with me, so I got it out and went to the right place. And just without thinking, I simply said, congratulations to the poor in spirit, theirs of the king, and went all the way through. They were quite taken by that. And I thought, why did I do that? And of course, the answer is that the Greek word mak makario is, is happy or blessed, but the Greek word makarismos which is, you can hear is, is related to it, means congratulations. And that's what was going on in my mind. And so I've, I've stuck with that ever since. And I think I can defend it. Uh, you, you may think this this special pleading, but it's as though Jesus had said, you know, the headmaster's speeches on Prize Day, you've heard a million of them. I'd like to congratulate the girl who got into Cambridge or the boy who got 100 at cricket the other day. It's as though Jesus was saying, congratulations to the boys who planted the cannabis plant behind the bicycle shed. So all the wrong people are getting congratulated. And I think if you, if you see it that way, I think congratulations probably works. But I'll allow you to, to decide on this. Here's another instance of um, formal equivalence. It's from Edward Harwood, who published a translation in 1768. He thought the King James Version was bold and barbarous, which I have to say I do not disagree. And this was what he, um, what he said. To his, his aim, to translate the sacred writers of the New Testament with the same freedom, impartiality, and elegance with which other translations from the Greek classics have lately been executed, and to clothe the genuine ideas and doctrines of the apostles with that propriety and perspicuity in which they themselves, I apprehend, would have exhibited them had they now lived and written in our language. The reader is desired to bear in mind that this is not a verbal translation, you bet your bottom dollar it's not, but a liberal and diffusive version of the sacred classics and is calculated to answer the purpose of an explanatory paraphrase as well as a free and elegant translation. I'm going to read um, his translation of a well-known passage. I want to give a prize. Well, I won't give a prize, but I, I want to re reward with a beam the first person to spot what is being translated. O thou great governor and parent of universal nature, who manifesteth thy glory... It's the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> yes, wonderful stuff, isn't it? 
um, and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, it ends, these requests we address unto thee, for thou art possessed of power which enables thee to succour, and of goodness which disposeth thee to befriend all thy creatures, and these thy glorious perfections will continue immutable and be the objects of praise and adoration throughout all the ages of eternity. Amen. Well, you get the picture, don't you? And you, you will have your own views. Here's another um, example, the same prayer with, with the introduction in, uh, in Matthew 6 from Eugene Peterson's translation. I don't know if you know Eugene Peterson's translation. But uh, the lead up to it, um, so right there, well, around about chapter, verse uh, 8, isn't it, of, of chapter 6 of, of Matthew. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with, and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply like this. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are, set the world right, do what's best as above, so below. Keep us forgive, uh, sorry, keep us alive with three square meals. Quiet. <laughs> keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. And this next bit, I think, is borrowed from Hopkins. You're ablaze in beauty. I don't know where that comes in the Greek. And then uh, our man goes, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so you'll have your own views, but that is an example of, of um, dynamic equivalence. <laughs> what about the next category, which is enriching the target language? That happens quite a lot. Um, Anglo-Saxon was thought not to be a language appropriate, uh, with, we're not allowed to call it Anglo-Saxon now, are we? It's Old English. It was thought not to be a language appropriate for translating the sacred religion. So what, what you've got, and you can see it quite clearly in the manuscripts, is Latin manuscripts, um, the Cuthbert Gospel isn't one of these, but there are several of that period that are, with, ha with Old English glosses above the line. Very interesting what happens there, because slowly, Anglo-Saxon turns into a language in which it's perfectly possible to translate um, the Bible. And so it's part of the process by which um, the language of Chaucer came to be formed. So something happens to languages when you translate into them, particularly, I suggest, when you translate Bible. And that happened in Zulu. In Zulu, when they translated the Bible, um, they've got words, they didn't have a word for bishop, uh, apostle or angel, so they kind of transcribed it, umbishopi, with a lovely Zulu plural, ababishopi. Um, an apostle is umpostoli, abapostoli, and an angel is ingelosi, um, and the plural is izingelosi. And they're terrific Zulu words, and if you were to ask a Zulu, are those Zulu words? They'd be genuinely puzzled, because of course they are, he would say. And of course we can't mock, because those three words in English reveal their Teutonic origin, which comes from Latin, from what were originally, all three of them, were originally Greek words. So that's what happens to languages, and languages get enriched by them. Then, two or three years ago this month, I was in Guyana, the top end of, of, of South America, helping the process of translating the New Testament into Patamuna with the Bible Society. It was one, one of your projects. And... Um, the reason they were doing it was because the Patamona language was dying, and they thought if you translate it into the New Testament, uh, oh, sorry, the New Testament into it, it might, it might be, remain alive. And I'm not sure what, what the upshot has, has been. But we were working on John's Gospel, and one concept that's kind of important in John's Gospel is that of cosmos, world. Now, extraordinarily, in, um, in Patamona and a neighboring language called uh, Hawaii, they don't have a word for world. They just don't, don't need it. So what they did there was to, um, they kind of transcribed it as they heard it. And so in Patamona, you will see if you look at John, John 3, um, you'll hear the word is wolu, or in, in Ahawaiu, it's oru. 
And so they're just they're simply hearing it and putting it in, and then they kind of say to themselves, and this is what is meant by it. And I gave a kind of note about how John's Gospel uses the, the Greek word cosmos. So I found that, that quite illuminating. Then fourth point, and I really am deliberately trying to finish as quickly as possible, false friends. I mean, there are all sorts of, of things like that, aren't there? Um, a friend of mine was telling me that on a beach in Belgium, he saw, where there were some very sharp rocks, he saw a notice inviting English visitors not to bless themselves on the rocks. Because the French word blessé is a false friend. It doesn't mean to bless, but to, to injure. Uh, and I was on the Eurostar not long ago, and um, we were about to go into the, the tunnel, and uh, the, the, not the driver, but the chap in charge of the train said, we're now going to go into the tunnel. The crossing will last during 20 minutes. And I thought, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's a, it's a slight misunderstanding of the way in English we would translate the French word pendant. But it's absolutely clear what is meant, that during 20 minutes. So is that a bad translation or not? Well, no, it's not really. Um, and particularly something technical like that. I mean, you were talking about technical language. Um, you just need to get clarity rather than, than um, the best possible style in the target language. Or Charlotte was talking about dead metaphors. One example of a dead metaphor is the word redemption. Practically no one who uses that word now remembers that it's a metaphor from slavery and buying people back. Very, very lively in that first century. It could have happened to many hearers of the New Testament text. But we use it absolutely without any idea of what it means, and it's become a dead metaphor with which we, we feather our nests. So I think that is a false friend, and, and one thing we might sensibly do is, is look again at words like redemption or save and see what we can do with them to, to rescue the metaphor. Then um, ideology, point five. Actually, that, that sounds more hostile than I mean it to be. I, I don't mean ideology is, is a sort of bad thing, really. What do you do about um, inclusive language? I mean, my view and, and the view of, of the chap I publish, or who, who publishes my, my um, excrescences, um, is very strong with inclusive language. I mean, if you're excluding half the human race, you're doing it wrong, it seems to me. But here's, here's an example in Hebrew. Tehi yadika, let your hand be al ish yaminika, um, on the uh, man of your right hand, al ben adam, on the son of man, um, the, um, the son of man whom you uh, what, made strengthen for yourself. And that's obviously very, very inclusive language, and the Greek does exactly the same. Genetheto he kasu, let your hand be epandra dexiasu, on the man of your right hand, ka epichion anthropu, and on the son of man, um, hon ekrataiosa seau, to whom you strengthen for yourself. And now there, I made an exception to my normal, and you may think this is just, just bizarre, um, uh, my normal um, rule of using e inclusive language, simply because that particular metaphor, I thought, in that particular psalm, was talking about the king. And then you say, well, you know, shouldn't women be allowed to be kings also? And so it's very, very difficult. And I do not know that that was the right move, um, but I simply confess publicly that that's what I did. Or another example from John's Gospel. Again and again, you meet the eudaioi. And if you've got any sensitivity at all post-Holocaust, you want to feel really embarrassed when you hear Jews, as it's, frequent, as it's normally translated, um, in, a, in such a very negative sec setting as it almost always is. So I, when I can get away with it, which in John's Gospel is most of the time with only a little bit of bluffing, I tend to translate that as Judean rather than Jew. And it gives you a much better feel it's a reminder of the terrible um, anti-Semitism of which we Christians have been guilty of uh, over the millennia. Um, but maybe, maybe I'm avoiding that particular painful challenge. And not in every case in John's Gospel does Judeans get away with it. So I simply put that before you as a query that I don't believe I've properly solved. Or again, with ideology, the Zulu word for God. Um, the missionaries did really great and sensitive work in the 19th century, translating, um, uh, writing, they were the first people to write Zulu down, working out the grammar, and then, of course, translating the Bible into Zulu. What do you do with God? 
I mean, God kind of appears here and there in the Bible. So they did what you might reasonably do and asked the Zulus, what's your word for God? The Gosas have a, a word, Diko, which they presumably had got from their, um, because it's a, it's a, it's a what, what are you not allowed to call them Bushmen, the Khoisan. Um, they have those, uh, those clicks. But in Zulu, it's umvilingangi, what the, the word that they use. And umvilingangi is quite close to Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas' view of the first unmoved mover. So actually, not bad as a translation. So they went with that for a, for a while. But then some people said, oh, well, no, that's pagan. You can't have a pagan name for God in our Holy Bible. And that's an argument we've heard quite often, isn't it? So they said, all right then, and they went to Jehovah, U Jehovah, you will find it in many uh, middle range um, translations of the Bible into Zulu. Then I think finally they worked out that calling Jehovah is a confusion of the consonants of the divine name, the tetragram, with the vowels of Adonai as a warning that you do not under any circumstances attempt to uh, pronounce the divine name unless you're the high priest in the temple on the, Hol uh, in the Holy of Holies in the, um, on Yom Kippur. That's the only time that the, the sacred name may be translated. But of course, that's quite unsatisfactory. So what do they do now? They invented. And now the Zulu word for God is unkulu unkulu. And the repetition, kulu, kulu, kulu means big, so it's kind of Mr. Big or Mr. Very Big, and that's how you do a superlative in Zulu. Uh, and of course, Zulus no longer notice the slight absurdity that they're calling God Mr. Big. But you see what we've done to, to the language. But ask any Zulu now, what's the word for God? And he'd say, nkulu, nkulu, and, and would not have a problem with that. And then there are the Tagumim. Uh, you know what the Targumim are, the Aramaic translation, one of the very earliest attempts at serious long-term translation. Uh, it comes just after the Septuagint, but not long after, I suspect. And one, one of the things about the, the Targumim is that they, they feel quite free to add stuff in. So in that chilling chapter 22 of Genesis, when you've got the binding of Isaac, and you'll notice in that chapter, Isaac says nothing except where I can see the flame, Father, where is the victim for the sacrifice? And that's his last word. And never, ever speaks to his father again in the whole biblical narrative significantly. And they saw the, the, um, the lack of that in, in the, when they came to translate into Aramaic. And so they inserted a passage, and you'll see this in the Targum Neophyti, a passage that says, it has Isaac saying, Father, bind me tight, lest inadvertently I kick out against the knife. So they want Isaac to be absolutely in favor of what Abraham is doing, which is not the most obvious way of reading the biblical text. Or another, another example, um, to avoid um, anthropomorphism in the, in the Aramaic, for example, in the account of creation, when God is actually doing something in the world, um, so getting his hands dirty, which happens a lot in the J account, of the of the uh, uh, of the um, Pentateuch, um, they have instead of God saying something, it's the Memra di Hashem, and Memra is the Aramaic word for word. So the word of God said, "Let us create humanity in our own image and likeness." And you can see what they're doing, but is that a translation or not? Over to you. Then um, post-colonial theory. Um, uh, I'm a bit elderly for that, but I, I sort of pick up stuff on it. <laughs> what do you do about slavery? For those of us in the Catholic Church, yesterday the, the second reading was, um, was Philemon. And a lot of people accuse Paul of one, bullying poor old Philemon, and two, doing nothing about getting rid of the institution of slavery. What are you going to do when you translate? I mean, it seems to me, yes, quite immoral to do anything that makes you think or makes your reader think that slavery is okay. But the fact is, Paul doesn't institute a campaign against slavery, presumably because um, if the Titanic is sinking, what you don't want to do is, is rearrange the deck chairs. Um, so, you know, he thinks Jesus might be coming back by next week at the very latest. And, um, and so he... Uh, um, he, do, he doesn't attack the institution of slavery, though I think if you read Paul carefully, 
those Christians who have said, um, and of course, slavery is in accordance with the will of God, just haven't been listening sufficiently carefully. But there is a responsibility for translators there. There's also a responsibility when you come to look at the role of women. Um, the Bible is a patriarchal text. There's no getting away from it, and, and it is thoroughly an androcentric. And it seems to me we are bound, where we can, to um, remove anything that commends the view that half the human race are second-class citizens. But then people say, but wait a minute. Are you actually translating the text? If you say, for example, men and women, hyphens and so on. Again, I, I put that question. I mean, in, in my translation, I, I, as far as I possibly could, I always use inclusive language. So all the way through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew is talking about Adelphoi, and I always wrote brothers and sisters. Um, and I suppose if you force me, I'd say, well, of course Matthew means both. Or Paul, when he, address, when he writes his letters, he's always saying Adelphoi. Um, but I, I, you raised this question, so I'm, I'm sure uh, looking at some of the Pauline texts, that he regards women and men as equal. And some of them are valued co-workers and using a word that is high praise on Paul's lips. Um, so I think I'm defending Paul um, at times from himself. And then some people in po post-colonial theory say that you should make it sound foreign when you translate. I don't know if any of you have read um, Ronnie Knox's book on Englishing the Bible. Very, very interesting and thoughtful one from someone who translated the Vulgate into English, but with great care, and went to the trouble of learning some Hebrew. And he's got certain views, and he, but he wants it finally to sound like English, not um, the discomfort that, that uh, um, a translation into sort of part, partial English would give you. Um, I'm not sure that I'm at ease with that, though I noticed that the King James Version does that from time to time. So, for example, a frequent expression, I know thee who thou art, that is not English. It represents the indeclinability of the Hebrew relative pronoun asher. Um, but it, it's not strictly speaking English. But there's something quite good about that. And it has affected English, uh, I know thee who thou art. And we can say that now without any sense of oddity in the English tongue. And then seventhly, embarrassment. Um, I am slightly embarrassed about this. Um, in John chapter 6, there's, uh, for the first half of that chapter, the word for eat is esthio, which is a perfectly regular word for, for eating. But the second half, where Bultmann saw um, what he called a sacramental redactor, I don't, think, I don't think he was right about that, but you can see what he was getting at. They use a quite different word, which is trogo. And trogo is what an animal does to, to crunch or munch, um, rather like the German fressen as opposed to essen, that, that kind of distinction. So I went for munch, which led me to a really embarrassing live interview on Radio Ulster, where there was a, a <laughs> poetess who, who really didn't like this translation from beginning to end. Um, and she was asking me, do you realize, and I have to say I didn't, munch has sexual connotations. I had no idea. Um, just in parenthesis, um, a young former colleague of ours, Helen Ann Hartley, who last week was appointed a bishop in New Zealand, she was, I, I'm all in favor of that. And, oh, that's right, she was. Well, um, she was lying on the floor, howling with laughter at this point, and I was trying to keep a straight face while, while interviewing on, on, on Radio All Star. Um, so Helen Ann was not very helpful on that occasion, but she will be, make an excellent bishop. <laughs> or um, here, here's another um, minor embarrassment, which translators handle in different ways. In 1 Kings 21, 21, and a number of other places, you also find it in Isaiah, but it's mainly in the Deuteronomic history, uh, you've got Hikrati, I shall cut out, uh, Lahav, from Ahab in this case, um, Mastin Bakir, those who urinate against the wall. And it's a slightly disparaging term for males. And the, the Septuagint, God bless it, translates it, Ex uh, Olethruso to Ahab, I shall destroy from Ahab, um, Urunta against the wall, the one who urinates against the wall. 
And God bless it again, uh, the Vulgates translates that quite literally, into Fikiam, I shall kill, de Ahab, from Ahab or from the house of Ahab, mingentem ad perietem, the one who urinates, well, he translates it as to, to the wall, but it's the same idea. Then I looked at um, Ronnie Knox, and he simply had every male of Ahab's house. Most modern versions go for male, except for the new, um, the new Jerusalem Bible, which goes for every man Jack. I'm not quite sure what a man Jack is. <laughs> then I looked at the, the, the King James Version, and God bless it, it was him that pisseth against the wall. And I thought, yes, you, you've got it right. And then I, I was uh, sharing this insight at a conference in the un, improbably named Kalamazoo. Um, and uh, someone had the impertinence to say, what did you do in your translation? I said, well, I think I said urinate. And she said, is that, do you call that translation? And she had a point because uh, pisseth is slightly better. But anyway, so look, to come to a conclusion, you can start waking up now and thinking of difficult questions. I think none of us, this is my conclusion, ever um, follows through our translation principles uh, with consistency. But they're not useless because they are guidelines rather than uh, rigid traps into which we're forced. And I think, um, two conclusions really, the first is that it is all uh, uh, an example of the basic hermeneutical problem, how can you and I ever understand each other regardless of whether or not we think we're talking the same language? And then secondly, and in my case, and, and in the case of many people here, uh, the Bible, um, that sub-question, how can we possibly understand a text where the numinous, where God, lies just below the surface? Right, so there you are, and um, well, over to you, really. <laughs> what do I do? Do I stay there? And Submit to interrogation. <laughs> so I'm slow. On that. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll go outside. Okay. Any interrogation? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for a really entertaining and interesting paper. Um, oh, two things. One, one is a, just a, a funny story about that piece of against the wall verse. You can see a very interesting um, sermon on YouTube by a guy in the States who is sure that we should all use the King James Version because that is, God spoke that language. Yeah. And there's quite a lot of those. But he you know, it does this amazing, kind of goes on and on about the translation of this and how new translations have changed it and they've got rid of this word. And they're doing it because it's all, they're all trying to be like, you know, modern and inclusive, but the Bible isn't like that. And he does a whole sermon about how men are um, going against the word of God when they urinate and sitting down. And he implores his congregation that they must, therefore, always stand up. But also against the wall. And, and, in, and, and talks about how in Europe, men sit down, and that's why Europe is having so many spiritual problems. So even, <laughs> so even if you translate it as directly as you want, you can't always make sure that people aren't going to do something ridiculous with your translation, can you? The other thing was just, um, on foreignization kind of of the text, so trying to keep it foreign, or and, it, and you were talking about post-colonial theory, um, how, how did you as a translator deal with the kind of, um, like for me there's an issue if I want things to be inclusive, um, but I don't really want to let the text off the hook, yeah. as it were. Yeah. And there's a problem in the States recently about translations of Huckleberry Finn, and they, they, what the school boards wanted was to erase the word nigger, mm. because they said it was offensive. And most of the kind of English literature departments were saying, yeah, but, but by having it in there we get to have a discussion. Yeah. We get to open up the yeah. discussion about these words and how appalling this racism was. Mm. So, how did you kind of... It's a, well, I put a note on 1 Corinthians 11 and said, you know, the word exousia, which is, might mean, or which should mean authority, women must have exousia over their hair. Jerem translates that as velum, and that's how... We, when I was a child, when we went into a church, if my mother or sister had forgotten to bring their veil, they used to have to borrow our dirty handkerchiefs and go in like that because of a, a particular way of reading 1 Corinthians 11. I think that a lot of people miss there is that Paul is quite clear that women and men 
equally can pray and prophesy. It's just a question of what they do with their headdress when they're, when they're doing this. It's a dress. But yeah, I mean, there are plenty. And very often, I would be tempted to blur over, to remove the challenge. And I'm not sure that I'm right in doing that, but that's my bland approach. But you're right to raise that uncomfortable question. John? It can depend on use mm -hmm. and context of what you anticipate from a group of users. And if you are worried about bringing your translation to a particularly aggressively patriarchal group, you might want to blur over it in yeah. order to repress it balance. And if you're bringing another translation to a group of people who are really willing to scratch their heads and have a good old think about yeah. the difference between the context. Yeah, and then I there you'd leave it. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Stuck. Yeah, and uh, I think Charlotte, you were saying that, or was it Marsh was saying this morning, that a lot of it is to do with the, uh, the audience you're thinking of. But of course, how can, if you're writing a translation, what on earth audience are you thinking of? Yeah, one of the difficulties is, of course, with our text, if we come back to this kind of special nature thing, yeah. because if we were debating a translation of, of something, kind of a story about women in the first century, you know, then you could gloss over it and blur over it, and, mm. and it doesn't really matter. But but say I've been in situations faced with someone saying, but if you translate this properly, yeah. women need to be quiet and they need to be yes. and they need, yes. you know, and it's a very practical, real, because of the, le the revelatory mm. nature and whether then a translation is yeah. not just, I mean, we get past faithful to kind of mm. weird theological discussions about sure. authentic, but it is a, it's a kind of practical sometimes yeah. issue, isn't it? No, I think that's right. So it's one, two. Um, I wish Chris could answer this question for me. Perhaps you can. I expect me to. <laughs> <laughs> um, why has the Gloria been made inclusive, but the Queen hasn't? Fascinating, isn't it? And I was, on, I, I was on one of the ICEL committees, not the one that did that, the one that did, uh, did Antifons. I have no idea. I mean, I'm, I'm always very pleased when they do that. And uh, let me just, I mean, we were kind of being guided by the secretary. We used to have to flog across the Atlantic three times a year for the, these committee meetings. And he said, uh, actually, get away with it whenever you can with inclusive language, because they're not against that as such. Where they get panicky is references to the Psalms that Christians read as references to Jesus. And he may have been being a bit charitable to them, but actually that may provide the answer, because in the, in the creed you've got the, the debates of those first four centuries on the nature of Jesus, who was unmistakably human. Um, and, uh, but they needed to say, and was made man. Now, I don't know why they don't say, and became flesh, because that quotes John's Gospel. Well, it's not so much that. It's um, for us men. And for us oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, you're, you're, you're quite right, yeah. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. It, it, it jars, doesn't it? Um, it really does. And I, I haven't got a sensible answer to that. Yeah. I've seem to be saying what I said for years and first heard donkeys years ago in the state, and you just say, for us. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I, uh, I think that's what a good many people tend to do now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, if you're translating, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you have a particular community, a particular audience in yeah, mind, yeah. a particular English-speaking community that you can imagine, a faith community, perhaps. Um, and I think you write for those people, however big your imagination is, or however sharp your imagination is, you write for those people when you're translating, and mm. it involves a large amount of creativity and a large, large amount of these political concerns, like post colonial concerns. Mm. And, uh, do, I, do I not include the inclusive language? And then you know, a translation that's published, but you never have a control authority about who actually takes your translation, mm. what might be mm -hmm. me. And I'm not a Christian. Mm -hmm. And then you've got an entirely uh, different concern. Yeah. I might not be interested in being addressed by the Bible at all. Mm -hmm. I don't mind if it's Mm. I'm not sure whether it says men and women or only men. I sure. just want to know, for instance, what Paul wrote. Yeah. Corinthians. I would like, like to be informed about what he actually wrote. Yeah. And then in those cases, that, um, of course, the concerns are entirely different. But also, standards of what makes a good or a bad translation mm. are entirely different. Mm -hmm. And let's know, like, English, the English speaking community is so vast. There's so many, so, such a large variety of diverse. People who speak English, but if you translate the Greek text to to English, 
you have no idea where it ends up in the yeah, world. And that's you true. Fix it on the shelf, and then what sort of yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And I've it. I've been attacked by people for um, uh, softening or weakening the androcentricity of the biblical text. And someone like yourself so might say, you, it, it's yeah. honourable actually to leave it as it is. So we've got to face it and deal with it there. I have no problems with. With reading the Bible and saying, yeah, it's completely outrageous, yeah. I have no problem with it. That's right. Because for me, yeah. it's a book originated sure. there and then, and yeah. those people have a lack of insights that we might not now have. So yeah. that's, um, I have no problem with that. But that's, you know, you have as a translator no control, I think, over, um, you, you can imagine a certain uh, readership, but that is always going to be more limited than. Um, who actually takes your translation yeah, of yeah, the show. You're absolutely right. Yeah. That's, that, that brings us on to an interesting point about... One and then well, sorry, your first... Uh, one but a lot of your paper is about the translation of the Latin text of the Eucharistic prayers of the Mass. Uh, or the Eucharist. And um, it strikes me that there, they're writing for the entire English-speaking world. Mm -hmm. And uh, that in itself presents a problem because you sure. simply don't know how That's right. all the issues we've discussed this morning about culture and receipt yes. and so forth. So you end up with that, I think, an issue that's a bit like democracy. And they, they, there's a conscious decision that there must be one English translation for the whole English yes. language. Well, like air traffic control. Yeah, that, <laughs> and that, reflecting on that for a long time, I, I conclude that that's probably right. But it's a bit like democracy, and mm. democracy is a good thing, mm. but with democracy, one definition is that everyone gets what nobody wants, <laughs> and it's just like a, a, a pan world, a, a global English translation, mm. it doesn't suit all the different cultures okay, yeah, yeah, right. and so forth, yeah. so it's, I wouldn't want to give it a democracy, but then you just get all these problems that come do. with it. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I'm saying, I think, uh, probably I, in my paper I expressed it too strongly, as Jonathan pointed out, saying that translation is impossible. But it's jolly difficult. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. I'm just interested to know how you deal with a say, theologically loaded technical term, a word, so whether it's in the Hebrew or the Greek or the Latin, whether it's been translated along the way or not. But the process you would go through as a translator for dealing with that. Now, as a non-biblical scholar, I'd probably with minimal Greek and no people will ask it. It's hard for me to know. So, I mean, for instance, with Sanskrit translations, often it will be a full translation to English, no original vocabulary will be left. Mm. But a lot of people would leave words like dharma or karma mm -hmm. that are just incredibly complex technical mm. terms with explanatory notes, yeah. saying, oh, I'm, no, I'm leaving this in because you can't action doesn't do this yeah. justice or duty or law yeah. does not capture, I mean, with health, I mean, I imagine like Holy Spirit or something like that is the kind of term that presents yeah. real difficulties. Well, righteousness is a good example in court. Which is what? Righteousness is a good example. So I'm not hearing a word. Righteousness. 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 Oh yes, what do you do with dikaiosune? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And basically, you're reduced to footnotes. I mean, I don't transcribe. I, I actually put a translation. I probably would normally use righteousness. I can't remember which I use, whether it's righteousness or, or justification. I try to be consistent, but then I put a footnote to, to indicate some of the difficulties. And of course, as I was saying about Zulu and English, um postoli and um, um bishopi, and they now become Zulu words and, and have enriched the language. But it's so difficult. Yeah. Do, do you pick one <coughs> translation of that word that you would then use consistently? Generally, but uh, interestingly, my, my aim, a very silly aim when I started out, was that every time I saw a particular word in Greek, I would translate it the same way. Crazy. And I found one, I can't remember where it is, but somewhere in Revelation 21, I had to translate the verb, the adjective katharos in two different ways. Otherwise, it wouldn't have made sense in English. So you've just got to be so, so careful. Um, so translation can't be done. <laughs> John. Just on picking up your point about the Psalms and the inclusivising them. Mm. Uh, this is just a matter of information. I, I was on the Treasury England Committee that produced our new Psalter. Oh, yeah. We generally uh, inclusivise where we could. But with Psalm 8, oh, we, yes. produced, we produced two alternative versions. Oh, did you? One inclusivise. <laughs> And one left may also be used Christologically. Yes. Along the lines you were suggesting. Yeah. There seemed to us no 
no way through that. Problem. That seems to me an admirably Anglican solution, actually. <laughs> and I mean that in full praise. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> John, thanks, John. I'd like to support you in your choice of Judean oh, yeah. instead of Jew. Um, and there are some people who argue, I think, very powerfully for it as well, like my friend Steve Mason. Oh, yes. Um, he will always, always, always translate Eudaios as Judean mm -hmm. in Josephus. Oh, even in Josephus. In oh, that's it. Mind you, I think you can get away with it in Josephus much more it's easy. Um, because you, Jew is a perfectly legitimate translation of Judaeus, mm -hmm. and Judean is a perfectly legitimate mm -hmm. translation of Judaeus. When you say Judean, it takes you back to the time and place you, you, you imagine a, a Roman province when we're thinking of you know, New Testament. Attached to Galilee, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And you are referring to people whose ancestral origins, <coughs> ancestral religions, are rooted in this ancestral geography, yeah. with this ancestral religious place in the middle of it. Yes. So you die. Judeans also live in Rome, and they also live sure. in Alexandria, yeah. but their neighbours know them as you know. This is Yohanan the Judean. Yeah. Because his ancestors are from the place where the God of Israel lives. Yeah. And so it's got this ethnic, ancestral, and geographical connotation. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the Judean has to live in Judea. Yeah, the difficulty is that then, as now, the word Jew has so many different connotations. But you might be a Jew and not, for example, believing in God. I get two hands over there, when very quickly. When you translate uh, Judas as Jew in the New Testament, none of us can help thinking an adherent of a religion which yeah. is different from Christianity. Sure. And when Paul says you don't, he does not mean a, an adherent of a religion which is different from Christianity. Well, he talks about his Zarathustra ento judaismo in, uh, mm, in, yeah, in yeah, Olympics. Steve yeah. Mason, 2010. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Judaismos is a cognate noun from Judaism, which means yeah. Judaize, to uh, protect the ancestral customs and to make sure, sure that they are yeah. reserved properly. Yeah. It does not mean a religion, yeah. and it does not mean one that is distinct yeah. from another religion or Christianity. Yeah. No, it is, it's a good point. Bridget, you've been waiting patiently. I think on balance, I would still teach John's Gospel using Jew. Uh -huh. And I think that's because I think Judean glosses some of the polemic within the Gospel. And that one of the most fruitful things I've done in the last several years with my John Greek class is let me sit with the language in for your dialogue in John 8 right. for a long time, letting it soak in some yes. implications of what it means, which gets lost if you're just if you're saying Judeans. Yeah. And I think I'd rather sit with the difficulties yes. and have the conversations around. Yes, and I can I can see Yeah. No, I, I I see the force of that argument. Yeah. yeah. It's great when you've got the Greek in front of you, and so if you're teaching a Greek class, it makes life a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh -huh. I would also make the point that I think Judean, if you like, in the gospel context, and John particularly, um, there are political issues which are swirling around here, which are not the same as those which appear in uh, Pauline epistles, for instance. That's true. Yeah, that is true. Though sometimes it's Judean against Galilean, and there it's, it's quite reasonable yeah, to... Yeah. Are we talking about, uh, are we talking about Paris people? You know, that there are all yeah. sorts of possibilities yeah. here, and the moment you start picking that particular term, yes. you're, okay, you're abandoning some problems. Yeah. Do you see what you're doing? You're proving my thesis that translation is impossible. <laughs> yeah.